the same way our interaction with God is also a speaking interaction. So we cannot come to God's presence and be so odd, odd as in A-W-E-D, as not to speak at all. Do you understand? So prayer is basically more of speaking to God. But tonight, I'm going to be looking at the dimension where all of us are used to, which is the asking and the receiving. Praise the Lord. There's what the Bible calls praying and means. James chapter 4, verse 3 tells us, You ask and you receive not because you ask and miss. That you may... That you may consume it upon your lust. So there is the propensity that the believer prays and he prays and means. To pray and means is to pray out of order. You know? To pray out of order. So if, if, it's, if, if there is praying and means, there is also praying on point. Are we together? If believers can pray and miss, then automatically we can also pray on point. So how do I pray as a believer and know that I will receive the answer that is due to me? How do I pray as a believer and I know that I will receive the answers due to me? I'll just share three things tonight. Now, that's not exclusive, but I believe that these three things are important. Number one, to pray and to pray aright, the believer must understand the fatherhood of God. What I call it, the believer must understand what? I can't, I can't hear you. You must understand the fatherhood of God. You must understand the fatherhood of God. Proper praying to receive stems out of understanding of the fatherhood of God. That God is a father. He is not just a father. He is my father. And he's not just my father. He's a good father. He's a loving father. And he's a father that is willing to dispense to his children. I, I know that for us in Africa, we have a warped view of fatherhood. You know, the way we were raised, um, it's, it's kind of not balanced. For those who are raised in this part of the world, you know what it means to have a father who comes in from his office and everybody has to behave in his presence. Do you understand what I'm saying? A father that when you make a mistake is always willing to beat you. That is the kind of fatherhood that we have seen. But that is not the expression of the fatherhood of God. The fatherhood of God is a good, loving, and a giving father. He's a father that gives even when you do not deserve it. Number three, is a father who gives and does not expect you to do anything for you to receive. Amen? Most times we think that before I can get anything from God, there are some things I must do to get. So believers go into the work mode trying to do, to impress, before God can give. The fa God the Father does not need to be impressed before he does for you. It is his responsibility to do for you. Amen? That is how good this Father is. So when we pray from the understanding of the fatherhood of God, prayer life becomes easy, praying in faith becomes easy, because you know it is your Father's delight to give to you. Out together? It's your Father's delight to give to you. Let's look at Luke 12, 32. Let's start from there. Luke 12, 32. Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Luke 12, verse 32. It says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is your Father's good pleasure. It's your Father's good pleasure. It is His delight. It is His joy. To give you what? The kingdom. He is pleased doing it. He is happy doing it. Why? He is a responsible father. Giving his children is a proof of his love. Is a proof of his responsible attributes. Out together. The earthly father might want you to do. And then say it's because you didn't pass your exam. So I will not do this to you. I, have you seen fathers like that? They deny you because maybe you failed in school. They deny you because maybe you broke a plate. And we have seen fathers recently that even beat children and their children die. Maybe because the children stole money and then you beat and beat and beat. The father that most of us see of God is the one that sits on the throne, who carries a seat on the throne, who carries a cane, and is ever willing to beat and punish you when you go wrong. That is not God the father. No. 
It's not. It's not. As a matter of fact, it's not counting your iniquity against you. And even says, if you sin, it says, my son is advocating on your behalf. Are we together? So, we must pray with the understanding of the fatherhood of God. Let's look at a few things about the father of the God. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We need to buttress that point. I am a child of God. I am a son of God. I am born of God. Amen? John 1, 12 says, you are, 12 and 13 says, you are born of God. You are not flesh begotten. You are God begotten. First John chapter 3 says, Behold, what has given to us, we are still coming here, that we should be called, we should be called the God. So, so we are sons of God. Sons of God. We are proud to call God our Father. Amen? Amen? Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. Matthew 5 16. Let's start from there. We look at 16 and we look at 45. Are you there? Let's read together. One, two, three, go. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify who? Jesus calls God your father. This was Jesus speaking. So they might glorify your father. So the God of heaven is who? My father. He is my father. Verse 45. Just jump to verse 45. 45 says, 45, let's take verse 5 together. 1, 2, 3, go. That ye may be the children of your father, which is where? In heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. That is how much the God the Father is. Says you are the children of your, of your father who is in heaven. And is as good, it's so good to level that those who are good, those who are evil, get the same benefits from him. He does not drop rain on the good and deny the evil. No. He's magnanimous. Praise the Lord. That is the fatherhood of God. Matthew chapter 6. Let's look at verse 5 from verse 5 to 9. Matthew chapter 6 from verse 5 to 9. You know, most of us, when we pray, we, we, we pray with fear. Yes, it's good to honor God, but fear is not part of honor. Perfect love casts away fear. Do you understand? Perfect love. When the love of God is perfected in you, fear is taken out of you. You can approach God understanding that he is ever willing. Amen? Matthew chapter 5 from verse 9. It says, when you pray, thou shalt not be like the hypocrite. Uh, for the Lord to pray standing in, standing in the synagogue and the corners of the street that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 6 says, but thou, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to your father, which is in secret. Pray to who? Your father, who is in secret. And your father, who seeth you in secret, will reward you openly. Each time you kneel down to pray, each time you stand to pray, each time you lift up your voice to pray, know that you are not praying to a being up there. You are praying directly to your father. Somebody say, my father. I can hear you. It says, but seven says, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be had for their much speaking. Children don't speak much. Children don't need to convince. Children know their right. Amen? I don't need to convince the father to do. So when you go into enormous words, when you go into vain repetition, what you are trying to do is to convince. Sonship, in sonship we don't convince. We know what is ours and we walk with what is ours. I'll get, I'll, I'll together. So Jesus said, don't be like them. He now says, for your father knows what things you have need of before you ask. God is much more interested in giving you than you are interested in asking or receiving. God is much more interested in giving to you. He's not a God that denies. He does not take pleasure in denying his children. He does not take pleasure. He does not deny. Bible says, he that lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that does not deny. He does not operate. Operate. Amen? He says, let him ask in faith. God does not deny his children. And he says in verse 9, after this manner, Therefore pray ye, 
our Father which art in heaven. So when you pray, understand that you are speaking directly to who? Your Father. You are not speaking to an anonymous, anonymous God what, who says, okay, your prayer is okay, collect. Your prayer is not good, don't collect. Amen? No. He is our Father. Matthew, okay, let's go to verse 25. The same Matthew chapter 6. Let's look at another point that Jesus told us there. It says, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, of, nor yet for your body, what you will put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Let's go on. It says, Behold, the fowls of the air, they do not sow, they do not reap, they do not gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father ensures that they are fed every day. Are you not much, what much than they? You what much than they? Which of you, taking thought, can add one cubit to his ears? It says, Look at the birds of the air. Go on. Look at the birds of the air, 28, 28, we are going on 28 now, 28, 28, they like slaves. Are we together? The house girl or the house boy needs to ask, but the child only goes to take what is his. Amen? So I get my point? So, so it says, verse 3, but seek it for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So your father knows you need all these things. Your father knows you need. And he is ever ready to supply. You see, when you begin to pray with this understanding, prayer becomes easy. Prayer becomes exciting. Praying with a heart and understanding that my father knows what I need and my father is ever ready to supply what I need. Out together. So I get my point? Let's look at Matthew chapter 7 again. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7 again. From verse 7 to 11. And I like this one. Matthew chapter 7. From verse 7 to 11. It says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives, everyone that seeks finds, and to him that knocks shall be opened. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son will ask for bread, will give him what? A stone. Has it ever happened to you before? Daddy, I'm hungry. Or mommy, I'm hungry. What should I eat? And then your mommy puts stone on the plate for you. Now, it says, he will not give him, if he asks for fish, he will not give him serpent. Verse 11. Next verse. It says, if you then, men, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father with heaven give good things to those who ask him? If you be evil, men who are evil, men who are not upright, if you will not be that wicked to the children that you gave birth to, how much more your father in heaven? So those of you who are thinking, the reason why I don't have this thing is because God is denying me. God does not take any pleasure in denying you. It's your ignorance that has denied you, not God. So I get my point? It's your ignorance that has denied you, not God at all. If you've been evil, know how to give good gifts. How much more your father give good gifts to them that ask him. And James chapter 1 tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from God the Father. Comes from God the Father. So when you pray, pray with this understanding of the fatherhood of God that is ever ready to give me good things. Is ever willing to give me good things. He does not get, gain anything by denying me of what is good. He does not take any pleasure when I'm denied. So you, you go without understanding prayer, and the way you construct your prayer is not as though you are begging. It's from the standpoint of, I am your son, you are my father. Lord, I want this. And he gives it to you. So, I get a point. I get a point. So you need to start praying from that understanding. The fatherhood of God. The fatherhood of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus, before he left, told us that I'm going to the Father, but I don't want to leave you alone. So what will I do? I will pray to the Father. He will send you the comforter. I, now, Jesus number says in verse 18, John chapter 14, verse 18, says, I do not want to leave you as orphans. I do not want to leave you as orphans. I do not want to leave you without any comfort. I don't want to... See, see how concerned he was. 
He was going, but he was concerned about what will happen when he leaves. He says, I do not want you, I don't want to leave you as orphans. I don't want to leave you alone. It does not give me joy. So, if I go, I will send somebody like me to stay with you and abide in you forever. I don't want to ever leave you. And that's why the Holy Ghost was given. And Bible calls him the promise of the Father. It's God's gift to us. That is the highest of God's gift to us after the death of Jesus. Amen? He freely gives to us without us having to do anything. We only receive him by faith. Are we together tonight? So let your prayer life, your way you want to receive something from God, pray with that understanding that God is my Father, is ever willing. Have you noticed that when children ask you for something, they do not want to hear a no? For those who are parents. They don't want to hear a no. Amen? My son has proven that to me several times. They don't want to understand why I cannot have it. Amen? Why I cannot have it. Daddy, is there money in your pocket when we are passing through some places? Anywhere they are selling pizza, domino, ice cream. You know, on the way home, we say, Daddy, can we have a pea? I know where it's going on. So, me too, I want to drive him around. What is pea? Pea, it ends with A. So I don't understand. What is it? So, they sell it in D, and it ends with O. Pizza from domino. <laughs> That's why I understand. Amen. So I said, I don't have any money in my pocket. But you should have in your in your purse. And I don't have my purse. What about your card? Amen. I want to eat. I want to eat. So it's, it's your job. You brought me here. So you understand? And I will never see him. At, you see, it beats my heart when I see young children who have to fend to eat. It shows irresponsible parenthood. When you, as a child of God, have to toil to get from God, it shows that God is wicked. And the God that is my father is not. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to do for God to give. He gives, if you can give to the wicked, how much more you? Abba. 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 Amen? So the father would have, somebody said, God is my father. Somebody is not saying as bad as it should be. I can't hear you. God is my father. God is our father. God is our father. God is our father. Hallelujah. Look at what God said in 2 Corinthians 6. Paul saying what God said in 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. He says, Wherefore come out from among them, be separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Verse 18 says, And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Almighty. He himself said it. I will be a father. A father to you. And you'll be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Hallelujah. So I've been understood that number two, the first thing is to understand the Father of the God. Number two, praying and receiving entails that we understand the will of God. Understand the will of God. That even though he's a father, he will not do anything out of his will. You understand? So you know that your asking should be within the boundaries of his will. So, even if my son asks me for something that I know is not going to be beneficial to him, I am not being wicked denying him. I'm only trying to keep him. I got a point. I got a point. So, even though we have said that God is not interested in denying you, there are some things that might be denied, not because God is wicked, but in his bid to keep you. You understand? In his bid to keep you. So, for example, if my son asks for coke on Monday and I give him coke in the morning, he asks for coke in the afternoon, I give him coke in the afternoon, he asks for malt in the evening, I give him coke and malt in the evening, Tuesday morning I give him coke. Do you know that I'm already doing something injurious to what? His health. So if I, if, for example, on a Saturday we, are, we went to a wedding and the child ate everything, he could eat all the cakes, all the, all the sweet, sweet things, do you understand? And the following morning he expect that we brought home so we should continue and we say, no, don't take cook. No, no malt. No, no cook. No cake today. No ice cream today. Now, he's not denying the child. 
what you are doing is protecting the interest and the health of that child. Do you understand? So even if God will ever deny, it's not because he, wants, he doesn't want to give you. He's only protecting you. So that is why we must know his will. He will never do anything out of his will. Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. In the prayer that Jesus you know, gave us the pattern of prayer. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God will never, listen to me, God will never, never, never do anything outside of his will. No matter how much you cry and pray, he will never. And that's why you as a son and a daughter must know the will of your father. You understand? You must know with the will of your father. And God's will is already perfected in Christ Jesus. Is the full expression of God's will. Why? Is the word of God. Everything is perfected in Christ Jesus. So there's nothing outside of Christ Jesus that God is going to give to you. Everything he will give to you, he has given in the great package called Jesus Christ. Romans 8.32 If he will not, you know, withdraw, come on, give us Romans 8.32 so I don't uh, misquote it. Romans 8.32 He did not spare his own son, but delivered him for us all. How shall he not with him also how freely give us a few things all things alongside with him he gives us all things to enjoy Colossians chapter 1 from verse 14 Colossians chapter 1 from verse 14 this is Colossians chapter 1 from verse 14 so everything is given alongside Jesus it says in whom we have redemption through his blood in the original manuscript, true, his blood is omitted. It's not there. They only added it for understanding. How we got it, amen? In the original manuscript, it's not there. So he reads the original manuscript, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Redemption is the forgiveness of sin. But for us to understand, they put it there, that he came by his blood. Now let's go on. Let's go on. Verse 15, it says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So God is the father, is the firstborn of all creation, for by him, how many things? All things were created that are in heaven, that is on the earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, how many things? All things. So everything consists in Christ Jesus. And he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that is in all things, he may have the preeminence. Now look at something here. Christ is, go back to verse 18, Christ is described as the head of the body. The body is you and I. Yes or no? Now, look at it. This is my head, and the body starts from the neck. Yes or no? Now, does anything flow from the head and the body is denied? No. Why? They are in perfect alignment and fixture. That's why 1 Corinthians 6, 17, if that is joined to the Lord, is one spirit. What flows in Christ flows in us. Are you together? What flows in Christ, why? We are already connected to him. There is a connection. Are you together? So it says, go back to that first uh, Colossians chapter 1. We are still there. Verse 18, so it says, is the head. Who is the child? The beginning, the father from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now look at verse 19. Let's take verse 19 together. 19 together. One go. For it pleased the father that in him, Christ, all the fullness should dwell. So everything you require is in Christ Jesus. Nothing outside of Christ. Nothing outside of Christ. Nothing outside of Christ. So in him, everything dwells. So everything is already perfected in him. So if you are in him, you are also perfected. Colossians chapter 2 tells us that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. Let's take together. 2, 9 and 10. One go. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And I am complete in him who is the end of all principalities and powers. 
So the will of God is already perfected in Christ Jesus. Nothing happens outside of him. So the believer must understand the will of God. The believer must understand the will of God. The same way, even though the father buys a TV in the house and puts a DSTV, the children know when is bedtime. Yes or no? The children know that the TV is yours. But there's a time to use it and there's a time not to use it. Even though it's yours, abuse is not accepted. Yes or no? So then that fact that your child wants to watch cartoon at 1.30 a.m. and you put your feet and say, no, go to bed, does not mean that that child, you are being wicked to that child. Even though the child might see from that perspective. But you know that you're only trying to protect his interest. Yes or no? So the child knows Oh, my dad does not approve of me watching TV 1.30 a.m. So even though he comes back from school and he has done his own work and he can watch the TV, he knows that once about 7.30, I need to shut down, I need to eat my dinner and go to bed while there's school the following morning. Are we together? So the child knows his father's will. So he aligns himself with it. Anything else of that will will mean that the father needs to discipline the child. Yes or no? Are we together? So, every believer must understand the will of God. For God will not do anything as of his will. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 4, part 1. Let's look at some few verses in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 5. Ephesians 1, 5. It says, Having predestinated us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, and he came according to the good pleasure of his will. So, our sonship, our adoption to sonship is according to his will. It's not because you are righteous. It's not because you did anything. It's just his will. Verse 9. Jump to verse 9. It's according to his will. Verse 9 says, Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in himself. Now let me explain this to you. He has made known to us the mystery of his will. Before we came into him, it was a mystery. When we came into him, it does not remain a mystery. It is a mystery to those who are outside. For those of us who are inside, it is revelation. You understand? It is what? Revelation. It is revelation. So the believer in Christ does not deal with God in mysteries. It deals with God in revelation. And every revelation is according to his good pleasure, which he already decided. He proposed inside himself. God proposed inside himself. So nothing happens outside what God has proposed. Amen? For example, there's no amount of prayer that a married man can pray, or a married woman can pray in asking God for a second spouse, except you want to kill the first one. The Lord, I don't, I'm tired of my wife. My husband beats me. I'm tired of her. Lord, I receive a second husband. Lord, I receive a second wife. In the name of Jesus. Your word says, I will have whatever I say. Lord, I decree. I confess. He kata. He gaba. He kata. God will just look at you and say, you are, you are out of order. Amen? So we must know his will. Verse 11. Let's look at verse 11. Verse 11, chapter 1, verse 11. Let's take the one go. In him we have also obtained an inheritance, been predestined according to the purpose of him who does what? Who works how many things? How? According to the counsel of his will. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. All things. So when we align with his will, it is easy for us to download. Yes or no? When we align, it is easy. When we pray in alignment with his will, it is easy for him to give us. Yes or no? So the believer must know accurately the will of God. Even the Holy Spirit, when he intercedes, he intercedes according to the will of God. He does not intercede outside the will of God. Romans 8, 27 tells us that. He does not intercede outside the will of God. Romans 8, 27. Now, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints. How? According to the will of God. That's the, that's the way the Holy Ghost prays. That's how he intercedes through you. So you cannot be praying out of will. Everything is according to his will. So our prayer must be in alignment with his will. 1 John 5, 14. 1 John 5, 14. 
1 John 5, 14. Let's take this one together. One go. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That's what? If we ask anything. Now, can you say the caveat? Ask for anything, but that anything must be within the boundary. So don't say, God says she asks for anything. I want a second wife. No. Is that part of his will? If it's not, it can't get answered. So if we ask anything, he now says, he puts a caveat. That anything must be within the boundary of my will. According to his will, he hears us. That is the confidence that we have. That when we ask anything that is in his will for us, he will hear us. If we do not ask according to his will, he will not hear. Are we together? So when we understand the fatherhood of God, we must also understand his will. Amen. And Paul's prayer was for the believer. Most of Paul's prayer was for the believer to come into the understanding of God's will. So he prays for us in Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 15. Let's look at it. Let's look at Paul's prayer there. Let's look at a few of Paul's prayer. Are you getting blessed tonight? Are you getting blessed tonight? Okay, he says, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all the brethren, all the saints, go on, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Yes. And what's the prayer? That the God of our Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That you may know. So his prayer was for the believer to come into knowledge. Knowledge. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. The same prayer. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. Colossians 1 9. It says, For this reason, we also since the day we had it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The believer's prayer should be, Lord, fill me. I receive, I receive, um, I'm filled with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You must be filled with it. The knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That should be a prayer. Because when you know his will, you can align with his will, you can walk circumspectly. You walk according to his will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 4, verse, uh, Colossians 4, 12. Colossians 4, 12. See the labor of one of the fellow workers of Paul, Epaphras. It says, Epaphras, who is one of you? A born servant of Christ greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you should stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That was his major assignment of praying that, Lord, they will walk in, we will, these people will walk in the will of God. And my prayer for you today is the same, that you will walk every day of your life in the will of God. That you will not step out of God's will for your life. That you will not step out of God's will for you. In any way, in your choice of who to marry, in your choice of job, in your choice of whatever you want to do, that you will not be so much encumbered as to go out of God's will. So many people are so much under pressure that they have put, they have allowed the society put on them that they go out of will. Amen? I've seen believing sisters who because of pressure, I must be a missus, I must be married, I must be married, I must prove a point. And they go out of God's will to marry a non-believer just because I just was married. Only to start regretting it. And they start paying the price for it. Why? They step out of God's will. Each time a believer steps out of God's will, it can set back the course of his life. Amen? So the believer must know God's will. Romans chapter 12 verse 2, Paul was, asked, was praying and was asking the believers that be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ephesians 5 17, he says, Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So not knowing God's will is outright foolishness. Amen? So we must flow according to God's will. And like I said, God's word is his will. You want to know the will of the Father? Stay in this. You want to know the will of God? Stay in this book. Hearing the will of God is made available to you. Sit down with the word. 
It brings you the knowledge of God's will. It tells you what, you see, whatever God wills, he has made available. Amen? If it is God's will, it's available. Have together. If it's in this book, it's already available. God is not going to do it. Everything he has been done in Christ. Everything written in this book has already been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Already fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So once you know it, it's already done. Amen? It's already done. What is not here cannot be supplied. Amen? If you will not go into a Chinese restaurant, and they will, you know when you enter church, if you have gone to one, as soon as you get there, they will give you their, their menu list. Yes or no? Now, having looked through the menu, you now look at it, macaroni, um, prepared um, grilled fish. You have looked at it. Uh-uh. You looked at it. Um, basmati rice. And this one, prawns. Look at it. Say, ah, I want a malang <laughs> It's strange. They will tell you, is it in that book? If it's not there, it's, we don't do it here. So you don't go to a Chinese restaurant and say, ah, I better put the book down. Give me the degree and I'm a And um, um, what do you eat? And no buffet. They can't supply it. Why? It is not in the book. And the same way you won't go to an Amala joint and be asking for basmatic rice and prawns. As a matter of fact, they won't give you a book. They have a blackboard. Amen. See, Fufu, Eba, Amala, rice, Ogufe, fish, catfish, you know. She will say, ah, there is no basmatic rice and prawns here. They say, ah, you will not know. Hallelujah. The will of God is the word of God. Amen. To know the will of God, what do you do? Sit down with this. It says, produce your strong reasons. Your reason is in this book. Amen. So, having understood the fatherhood of God and understanding the will of God, we're going to the third one, which is the last one we're going to discuss tonight, is having known that God is ever willing to give. And having known that this is his will for me, how do I now ask? Like we said, Everything God has willed, he has done. Are we together? And the fact that he's a father who is ever willing to give. So how, what should be my approach when I ask? Do I have understood that God is ever ready to give me and that it is his will? Will I still need to go and say, Lord, please, please bless me? Will I see, is it, is it okay to pray like that? Lord, if you will, heal me. Lord, if it's your desire for me to be married, please give me a husband. You understand? It contradicts the fatherhood of God and it contradicts the will of God. When we go pleading for what has been given, amen, we don't plead for what he has given because God will say, no, you don't have to plead. I've already released it to you. I've already given it to you. So are you pleading and begging for what I have given. So your prayer should not be a prayer of begging. You ask with thanksgiving. You ask with thanksgiving. That is how to pray to receive. Have you understood that the Father is willing to dispense? And have you understood that this is God's will for me? You ask with thanksgiving. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Philippians 4 verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything in prayer, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So the believer does not come begging God. In Africa, we are too sentimental and emotional in asking. We think that when we cry, when we cry, and we roll on the floor, and we do some certain gymnastics, God will look and say, oh, give him, he has tried. He has appeased me. Our father does not need appeasement to give. He gave in Christ. Are we together? He doesn't need any appeasement. He doesn't need anything. He said, I already gave it to you. So, you receive with thanksgiving. He says, with prayer and thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So, we receive with thanksgiving. So, Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Speak, he says, blessed be God, the Father Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to bless us. Who has blessed us? 
with every spiritual blessing in the places in Christ. He has done it already. He has done it already. So when you understand that God has done it already, how do you and I pray? For example, I need financial resources. How do I pray? I do not say, Father, in the name of Jesus, please, Lord, give me 100,000 naira. How do I pray? Father, thank you because, Lord, you have given it already. I am blessed in Christ Jesus. Lord, I receive the 100,000 naira by faith in Jesus' name. That's how to pray. Thank you because I have received it. No, Lord, please come and do. No. He says, I have done. Your prayer is a receiving prayer with thanksgiving. Lord, thank you because I have a job. Thank you because I have received my job. Lord, thank you because I receive my own spouse. Lord, thank you because I know you have already given him to me. You have given her to me. Lord, I receive him with thanksgiving in my heart. That is how a New Testament believer prays. Amen? Not, Lord, let my tears. Lord, please. No, he looks gymnastic enough, but it is out of order. Lord, thank you. That's how the believer prays. He prays with thanksgiving because he knows that God has supplied already. Are we together? That's how to pray. Let your prayer life change. Amen? I find peace when I pray like that. It's, it's, it's the easiest way to pray. All these bombarding everyone and say, Lord, Lord, please do. Lord, you must do. Lord, you have to do. Lord, come and do. He says, I've done. He says, Lord, I give you thanks. Lord, I thank you. I thank you because he needs the children's bread. Thank you that he took my pains. He took it away. I cannot have it. Lord, thank you because I'm healed. That's how the believer prayer prays. Lord, thank you because, Lord, you supply all my needs according to your written glory. Thank you because this need, particular personal need, is already supplied in Christ Jesus. Lord, I receive it. As Lord, you told me what to do in the physical to get it. Do you understand? That's how the prayer prays. He prays with thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praying with thanksgiving is a proof of faith. It's a proof of faith. Why? The believer knows he's already done. Listen to me. Each time you pray, God does not go into frenzy to do anything for you. Amen? So when I pray, I will move God to do. God says, He can't move me. Amen? All this prayer of moving God to do something is lack of understanding. God says, I moved in Christ 2,000 years ago. In Him, all things consist. And I already completed you and perfected you in Him. So don't move me. Say, I will do seven days. I will declare seven days. Biri, biri. Have you had believers like that? We do seven days. After seven days, we will move God. No, God says, you can't move me. You can't move me. Eh, no, 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 no. You can't move me. Okay. So your fasting should be more of alignment. It's good to fast. I do it. Should be what? Alignment. Alignment. Hallelujah. So prayer, praying with thanksgiving is a proof of faith. It shows that you already know it's done and assigned to you. Praise the Lord. Now let's look at some prayers in scriptures. Let's look at some prayers. Let's start with Jesus. Mark chapter 8, verse 6 to 8. What did Jesus do when he was going to break the bread and divide the bread? This was with feeding of 4,000. From verse 6. From verse 6. This was the 4,000. Feeding of the 4,000. He says, if I send them to their own houses, they will faint on the way. So the Bible says, he commanded the money to sit down on the ground. And what did he do? It was what he wanted was that this bread and fish she multiply. He didn't say, Father, multiply this bread. Please multiply this bread. What did he say? He gave thanks and broke the bread. Lord, thank you for this. We receive it with thanksgiving. That's what the Jesus did. No said, Lord, see this bread. Multiply it now. 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 Multiply it now. No, Jesus didn't pray like that. He gave thanks. The same thing he did in John chapter 6. When we were going to feed the, the 5,000, what did he do? He took the bread and he gave thanks. Amen? The little you have, give thanks for it. Do what? Give thanks. And you say, God, multiply. That's what Jesus did. What did he do at the tomb of Lazarus? He gave thanks. 
If you could have said, in the name, well, you could have put in his name then, because the name was not yet given the authority then, you know. You would have said, I command you, Lazarus, come out now. Every power, all the Lazarus down, go. Is that how we pray now? <laughs> every power from hell, every kidney serpent by power, everything holding down my miracle, go now. I command you, go. No. What did he do? He gave thanks. Father, thank you because you always hear me. And I know that now you will hear me. Faith. He now said to his Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. That's how to pray. Lord, thank you. Give no thanks. Let your prayer be done with thanksgiving. Change your mode of prayer. It has not worked for you. Giving of thanks. Giving of thanks. How did Paul pray in scripture? Let's look at that quickly. Is somebody getting blessed tonight? Is something changing inside of you? Amen. Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, we that's not again. Okay. Chapter 1 is not too bad to repeat. 15 to 17. Look at Paul here. Ephesians 1, 15 to 17. It says, <clears throat> Start from verse 14. Let me show you something. It says, okay, no, no, okay, sorry, 15. Sorry, sorry, sorry about it. It says, therefore, I also, after I had of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Now look at 16. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. How did he pray for the people? Giving thanks. He prayed for them by giving thanks for them. That's how to pray giving thanks. And what was now the content of his prayer? That the God of Jesus Christ will give you the spirit of wisdom. That was what he was praying. But he prayed that prayer, giving thanks. Colossians chapter 1. Or Philippians chapter 1. Let's look at Philippians before we go to Colossians. Let's look at this sequence. Philippians chapter 1, 2 to 6. He says, Grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, making requests with you. Don't be only now. Always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you. How? With joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this thing. So how did you pray for them? With thanksgiving and with joy. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 3. Colossians 1 3. Let's say together one go. We give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. How did you pray? With thanks. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. First Thessalonians 1, verse 2. Let's say one, two, three, go. We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. How did you pray? Giving thanks. Philemon 1 4. So can you see the way Paul prayed? One, two, three, go. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayer. So his prayer was laden with thanksgiving. You know, some believers' prayer is complaining. They say they pray. What they are doing is not praying. They are complaining. Oh, God, the Bible says you are faithful. You are righteous. You are good. But Lord, I pay my tithe. I am faithful as a worker in church. Why have I not? Amen. So don't pray like that. Give thanks. Give thanks. The fruit of your lips, Hebrews 13, 15 says, the fruit of your lips should be given of thanks. Given of thanks. When the believer moves into thanksgiving, he gets things from God easily. Amen? Thanksgiving. So, anytime you are sick and you want to pray, don't just start commanding. Amen? You confess with thanksgiving. So you locate the word that has to do with healing in the scripture. You understand? Meditate upon that healing scripture till it enters your spirit. And with thanksgiving, Father, thank you. Because once you have located it, you know that God has given it already. God is not going to, he has given it already. Thank you because in his own body he took my pains. And he hung on the cross for me, that by his stripes, I was healed. Lord, thank you because I received my healing. 
in the name of Jesus. That's how to pray. Anytime you need funds, money, locate in the scripture. Any scripture that has to do with receiving financial help. And then based on that, Father, thank you because I am blessed. I cannot be stranded financially. Lord, thank you because I receive this amount of money in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's how to pray. Amen. Will somebody start praying like that? Will somebody start praying like that? So you understand the fatherhood of God, that God is ever willing to give to you. Do you understand? So you don't even go doubting whether, you let me pray, in case, if God is on the right, if you wake up on the right side of the bed today, he will give. If he's angry, we'll keep praying. Until the day we find that he's favorable to us. God is ever favorable to his children. Amen? And number two, where we know what his will has already made available to us in Christ Jesus. Amen? And we know that by the word. And having known those two, we are approaching with what? Thanksgiving. Giving of thanks. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet this evening and let's just go ahead and just give thanks to the Lord. Just give thanks to him. Let's just, let's just give him thanks in the name of Jesus. Let's just go ahead and thank him. Giving of thanks. When you give thanks, your mouth is not shut. You don't think thanks. You open your mouth to give thanks. Lord, thank you. Lord, I give you thanks. Lord, I give you all the glory. I give you thanks. Lord, I give you thanks. Lord, I give you thanks. Lord, I thank you. Thank you because I am your child. Thank you because I belong to you. Thank you because I am yours. You are ever willing to give me the kingdom. You are, you are willing and you are already giving me your best in Christ Jesus. I have the best in Christ Jesus. That is the best gift I can give to you alongside with the gift of the Holy Ghost. You have given me your best already, Christ Jesus. And you have given me the gift of the Spirit. You are giving me your best already. Whatever I'm going to receive is going to be out of this. Come on, give him thanks. Give him thanks. Give him thanks. And then what is your request? Come on, ask me thanksgiving. Ask me thanksgiving. Do you need a job? Give him thanks for it. Because he has already given you. It's not his delight that you will go without a job. It's not his wish that you will not be married, that you will not be settled down. Ask with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known with thanksgiving to the Lord. Lord, thank you. Because I know that you have prepared for me a man. You have prepared for me a woman. You have prepared for me the right job. And Lord, I receive with thanksgiving today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Lord, I give you thanks. Lord, I give you thanks. Thank you because you supply all my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you because I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. Thank you because I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. Thank you because you have perfected all that concerns me already. Thank you because I'm perfected. I lack nothing good. Thank you because all my needs are supplied. Thank you because I am strengthened with might in my spirit. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for my tomorrow. Thank you for the hope that I have in you. Thank you because I go out daily and I get blessed. Thank you because as I go out daily, I come back in peace. Come on, give him thanks. That is how to ask. Ask with thanksgiving. Ask with thanksgiving. Father, we thank you. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that sweet? That Baba Shay, Lord, do it. Olua Shay. And God says, Angel, tell him I've done it. Tell him I've done it. You should just thank me for what I've done. 
and he takes it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what it means to say, to your son says, Daddy, um, thank you. Uh, I know you bought the Coke in the fridge because the Coke you bought in the fridge is for consumption. It's not for decoration, is it? The food in your pantry is it for decoration. It's for consumption. Oh, thank you for this food. Lovely. Can I have some cake? Amen. No, no, Daddy, please. You know, that, you, know they are, you know, when children come and say, Mommy, please, can I have Coke? You know they are just being mischievous.